gospel is the essence of our faith. It is the foundation. It's the very air we breathe. And I hopefully, as I share this, you will feel the Holy Spirit give you a breath of fresh air as you take in his word, take in his truth, take in his promises for you. And um, we're going to be in Romans 8, verse 1 through verse 4. Romans 8, verse 1 through verse 4. So feel free if you have a Bible and you would like to follow along with this teaching, uh, grab your Bible, look up on the Bible app. Actually, you can't do that if you're on your, your phone because it'll you can't do two things at once. So, But if you have a Bible, go to Romans 8, 1 through 4, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to um, just get started and, and just listen to um, some of God's words. So let me just pray. God, you were cursed in our place. You became sin, and you knew no sin, God, so that in you we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we look to you for understanding. We come to you as a, in a place of righteous standing before you, fully justified because of what you did on the cross, because of your blood. And God, we thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Trinity. Thank you for everything you do for us, God. We pray for the, the power to preach and share what you want me to say, God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I'm going to read the first four verses of Romans 8, and then I'm going to kind of take apart each verse uh, one by one as I go through this. So Romans 8 verse 1 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Amen. So in verse 1, it starts off and it says, Therefore, and this is a famous verse, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It starts off with a therefore. When you read the Bible and you see that phrase, therefore, uh, a simple way to understand that word is to see that it's there for. It's there for a reason. It's put there on purpose to remind us that there were things previously said in that chapter, in the context that this was written, to give us the fuller understanding of what this therefore stands for. And so this therefore refers to the previous chapters, um, specifically chapters 5 through 7. In chapter 5, it explains uh, the gospel. It explains that death spread to all men through Adam, but Christ was the fulfillment. Chapter Chapter 5 explains that there's no more condemnation for our sin. Chapter 6 explains that there's no more power that sin has over us. And chapter 7 explains that the law has no more power over us either. So it shows we're forgiven, there's no more power of sin, and the law has no more binding power on us. And because of these truths, because of what the Bible says beforehand, therefore, in light of these truths, in light of the fact which Paul is laying out in the book of Romans that Jesus died on the cross for our sins as the atoning sacrifice, therefore, in light of that, there's now, there is now something that happened. When you see the phrase now, if, if something happened now, that means something was different beforehand. So he's saying, therefore, there's now, there, there's something that's now new. And it's this, therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is now, in light of what Christ has done, there's now 
no condemnation. It doesn't say there's now a little condemnation. There's a little bit of um, judgment that you have to face. It says there is now no condemnation. No condemnation. Romans 5, 15 says this. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one man, one sin, and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death trespass of one man, death reigned through one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, verse 18, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so the result of one act of righteousness was justification for all men. And so what Romans 5 is saying here is explaining that Adam... When Adam ate the tree in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, he brought condemnation and sin for all men because all have sinned. All are under the law. All are under this curse. But now there's no more condemnation. There's no more judgment because Romans 5 explains that that the one man's sin, Adam, caused this death to spread. But the one man's righteousness negates what Adam did. It cancels it out because Jesus lived a righteous life and died on the cross and gave us his righteousness. And so now there's no condemnation. That's an amazing promise. But it doesn't say this is for everybody. It says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's saying for those, that phrase for those, it means it's for a select group. It wouldn't say for those if it's for everyone. It says for those who specifically are in Christ Jesus. This phrase, in Christ, is used often in Scripture, especially by Paul. It was one of his favorite statements. Galatians 2.20 testifies to this, where um, Paul says, uh, what does he say? I am, for I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in in me and the life I live I live unto God who loved me and gave himself he, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me he says it's no longer I who live I live in Christ 2 Corinthians 5 says if anyone's in Christ there's that phrase he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things are made new See, the phrase in Christ, it means that we're engulfed in Christ's life, that we've been saved. Those of us who are saved, those of us who are God's elect, God's children, those of us who choose Christ as Savior are those of us who are in Christ. You see, the Bible says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Most of the world is not in Christ. There's a broad road that leads to destruction, but the few of us who find it on the narrow way of being a Christian, those of us who are truly are born again are in Christ Jesus. It's interesting, this phrase Christ Jesus is used by Paul. The word Christ means Messiah, anointed one. So it's not like it's Jesus and his last name was Christ, like my name is Jesse Stokes. It's it's Jesus, the Messiah. That's what Paul's saying. Um, because through Christ Jesus, verse 2, so you see that, first of all, it says you're in Christ. Now it's saying through Christ, through Christ Jesus, the law. So now we're going to see this phrase, the law, come up over and over again. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. So here we see a, something that contrasts with one another. It says that there's a law of the spirit of life, and then there's a law of sin and death. So there's two laws that are at play. There's one law of the spirit and life. So the spirit contrasts with the sin. There's a law of the spirit and there's a law of sin. We either live by the spirit or live by sin. We're either enslaved to the spirit 
Like Paul says, I'm a bond slave of Christ, or we're a bond slave of sin. Jesus spoke about this in the Gospels where he said, if anyone's a servant of sin, he's a slave to sin. So you could either be a slave to the spirit or a slave to sin. Let me ask you, which one are you a slave to? Are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to the Holy Spirit? And then it says, through the law of the spirit of life. And then it's the law of sin and death. So the second contrast is life and death. If you're in Christ and you live for Christ and you walk with Christ, it leads to life and life abundantly. If you live in the place of being under condemnation outside of Christ, it leads to death. So you can either choose the spirit and life or sin and death. You see, the Bible teaches that sin actually gives birth to death. James says, sin, when it is fully conceived, or um, temptation when it's fully conceived, desire when it's fully conceived gives birth to sin, and sin brings forth death. When Adam sinned in the garden, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, was what God explained. So through Christ, we're now under the law of the Spirit. We live by the Spirit. We walk with the Spirit. We are in the Spirit. The Bible says later in Romans 8, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ in them, he does not belong to him. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the sinful man in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live not according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So verse 3 says that the law, see this phrase, the law is used three times, the law of the spirit of life, the law of sin and death here. It's saying the law. It's talking about the law spoken of in Romans 7. Basically, you can substitute the law for the commandments of God. At this time in the Bible, there's 613 commandments, 13 commandments, including the 10 commandments that we know, do not lie, do not steal. That law was powerless in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. This is spoken of in Romans 7. It's not the law that's the problem. It's not that God made an error in the law. It's that our sinful flesh could never keep the commandments. It could never do what God said to do. All right? Isn't this true when someone tells you, you know, don't think about a purple elephant. Whatever you do right now, do not picture in your mind a purple elephant. If I tell you not to do something, right, what did every single one of you just think of? A purple elephant, right? Because we are tempted to do what we're not supposed to do. Right? And so that's what the law is. It, it gave us this instruction, do not do these things. But in God saying that, we did the very thing. We broke the very commandments that we were not supposed to do because it was weakened by the sinful nature. Every one of us has a sinful nature. We're born. Psalm 51, David says, in sin did my mother conceive me. When we're born, we're born into sin. They say the statement, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Our identity is a sinner before Christ. And so our nature, the fruit of our lives, is sin because the root of our lives is a sinner. But we need to be uprooted and put in Christ so that that doesn't happen. So this law was weakened by sinful nature, but God did something. He sent Verse 3, his own son, which reminds me of John 3, 16, where it says, God so loved the world that he sent, he gave his only son. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Now it's saying that God solved this issue of the law. It solved this issue because this law needed to be fulfilled. So God solved this issue by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sent Jesus to become a human and be just like us. And he was tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. And he was able to fulfill the law. Jesus never sinned. Although it says he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, it doesn't mean Jesus was a sinner. It means he came in the body that sinners come in, the body of flesh. And Jesus came to be a sin offering. To be a sin offering. He came, Isaiah 53, 
talks about he was an offering for us. He offered his body to cover our sins. He offered his blood to wash us clean. And so he condemned sin in the sinful flesh. So Jesus condemned sin. I love this phrase because it shows sin brought us condemnation. So Jesus condemned the very thing that was condemning us. The very thing that was cursing us, Jesus cursed. He became a curse for us on the cross. He condemned the thing that was crushing us. That sin was condemned through Jesus' death, which caused us to now have no condemnation. Jesus cursed the thing that cursed us. Jesus became a curse. It says in the Bible in Deuteronomy, if anyone's on a tree, he's cursed. If anyone's hanged on a tree, he's cursed. Jesus was hanged on a tree. He became the curse. He condemned. He cursed. He defeated sin and death. That's why the Bible says, death, where is your sting? So he condemned in the sin and the sinful flesh in order, verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. The righteous requirements of the law. Remember we talked about those requirements of the law, 613 commandments. There's so much requirements of the law. This law is f fulfilled in us. We actually fulfill the law now because we're in the righteousness of Christ now and everything we do through the Holy Spirit in obedience to God fulfills with the Ten Commandments we could never fulfill because we're living by the Spirit. We're obeying God from the heart. You see, our lives are no longer trying to keep all these commandments. Our lives are now purposed to try to live by the Spirit. How do you know if you're living by the Spirit? Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the next verse, we often don't know this verse, it says, against such things, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. What that means is, a, is when you're walking in the Spirit, you're fulfilling the law. There's no law against that. You're walking the way God wants you to walk, in love. So if you're walking in love, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're fully reaching the potential God wanted to have for you. God's original goal was for us to live holy lives in obedience to Him. When we're walking in the Spirit, living by the Spirit, talking with Jesus, 